thank you for joining us on this panel. Um, so I'm going to do a quick show of hands, actually, uh, to start this off. So Redis, we had Redis uh, lead the conversation today. How many people in this room use Redis as part of their technology stack? Can you put up your hand? How many people don't know if they use Redis as part of their technology stack? Well, so we've got a lot of people who definitely don't. A lot of work to do there from a marketing perspective. But uh, I think it's a very, we're here to talk about marketing and technology today. And I was just reflecting um, on, you know, I'm proud of my current role as CEO of Leadspace. I, was, I ran marketing for a CMO over at Salesforce for a while. And back in 2012, we used to quote a lot a study by Gartner, which I'm sure many of you remember, where they came out with this very famous quote that in five years, the CMO will influence more technology spending than the CIO. That was 2012. So a lot of technology companies sort of ran with that to the presses. And here we are five years later. Right? And I just read a study um, before we kicked off here that says, I think Gartner's latest estimate is that 27% of marketing budgets are being spent on technology. That's actually slightly larger than programs or, or paid advertising and about the same as people cost. So this is a, whether we are at the same level as CIOs, I don't know. Maybe the panel will have a few comments on that. Um, but I think this is a really, really important topic. And to understand how that continues to progress and how us as marketeers need to think about technology, I'm super excited to have a panel of awesome people. And I'm actually going to let them you know, walk along, introduce a little bit about themselves, their company, a little bit how they got into this fantastic world of marketing tech. And then we'll kick off with a few questions. And I will leave open at the end, just so you get your creative juices flowing, 10 minutes at the end for some Q&A. So let me first kick off with you, Nick. Do you want to just a quick introduction, a little bit about uh, Of course. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Edward. I'm co-founder, president, and CMO at Lookbook HQ. Lookbook HQ is an intelligent content marketing platform. Essentially, we're obsessed with what happens when people click through to content. How do we get them more of the things that they need in session? And most importantly, how do we actually track and uh, monitor that engagement to assess the quality of it. Obviously, there's very difference between someone that spends six, piece, six seconds with your, with your white paper and someone that spends three minutes and goes on to engage with more content. Our customers are mid-market and enterprise B2B companies, pretty much exclusively. Companies like Thomson Reuters, Cisco, ADP, Polycom. Uh, you know them all. Very happy that Manish and Redis Labs have just become uh, a customer last week. Um, so I'm relatively late into marketing. I'm one of those people that Jeffrey referred to this morning. I'm a business person that's transferred into marketing. I'm a strategy consultant by background, although uh, Doug asked me to say something interesting about my background. So uh, here's my one very minor claim to fame. You might hate me for this. You might love me for it. but. I did, uh, I went to university, I went to school and then university with Coldplay, the band, and I funded their demo single. And I'm still waiting for the 1% of everything they ever earn, which, uh, which I'm pretty certain they promised me over a kitchen table and a couple of beers. Um, until then, I'm very much working in marketing technology. Great. Very nice. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Alex Hart. I lead digital marketing at NVIDIA. Uh, we pioneered GPU computing um, a number of years ago. Uh, we've, uh, we've been around for about 24 years, and, um, and that computing technology is now being re, um, reinvested and repurposed for artificial intelligence, autonomous driving, um, and really all of the computing tools that kind of sit between virtual reality gaming and uh, accelerated computing. So, um, so in digital marketing, I'm responsible for, uh, for our marketing tech stack um, and all of our digital experiences from mobile to web to digital marketing like social email and, uh, and paid media. Hi, I'm David Sue from CA Technologies. Um, CA Technologies, enterprise software company. Hopefully we don't suck. You know, earlier today, someone said that enterprise software suck. Uh, I, I have been with CA for about three years. I'm a product marketer at heart, and most of my career has been in product marketing. Recently took on this role overseeing the MarTech stack, so anything that has to do with automation, leads coming in, things that feed, feed over to our salespeople and all the different tools that manage that, I oversee that. Also the analytics, uh, all the reporting coming out of that. Um, you know, One of the things with CA is that we have a lot of old school software, 
IE mainframe. And then we have a lot of uh, new products coming out, which is like SaaS based, completely different models in terms of the business and also in terms of marketing. And that really you know, puts a lot of strain on, on myself and my team in, in figuring out um, how to manage that efficiently. So one, uh, you didn't share an interesting thing, by the way, about yourself. Not to put you on the spot, I'll go first. I'll give you time to think. So uh, I, I was trying to think of what, what's interesting. I was thinking back to my very first job and it was uh, selling pretzels from a cart. So I'd, also, I'd always have to roll a cart out into this park, you know, bake all the pretzels there and then sell it. And in my role now, like, uh, you know, with 5,000 tools in the marketplace for MarTech, I could really start to think back of ways in which we can make that process more efficient because it really wasn't back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll say, so way back when uh, I kind of started my, my early career at Pepsi, I worked at Pepsi for, for eight years, and one of my first digital marketing programs, I did one of, one of the first kind of big deals at Pepsi with MySpace. And that was kind of at the forefront of when we thought we were really doing social media in a big way. And I think we're kind of at that same point in kind of starting to think about the future of AI and that we're, we're kind of, we're, we're dancing and investing in probably kind of really the early generation of what's gonna be, you know, we'll kind of reflect and look back later. Uh, but I think, well, MySpace was, <laughs> was kind of the, the start of, of social. So AI will be as passe as MySpace. When That's what I am, perhaps. We'll come on to that a little bit later on. All right, well, look, so I want to start, you know, by addressing one of the bete noirs in the room. Um, I was on my way down here reading a study, and, and it said, on average, a marketeer has about 18 different SaaS products, and it could be as high as some of the high-end 60, 70, 80 different SaaS products that they're using today. And, you know, you come to conferences like this, or Dreamforce, or anything like that, and it's just a C. And we talked a little bit about you know, some of the strategies that you know, I used to use and others. I, I'm sure we all turn our voicemail off, right? Because like, it's just a disaster and don't have a phone. I don't think Connect and Sell has figured out how to automate sending me a text yet, but no doubt Conversica will. But the question for me, for each of you, and Alex maybe starting with you, you know, how do you, A, keep an understanding and be current and understand all of the latest trends and be at the same time, see through all the noise and think about it and manage and make sensible decisions. Yeah, I think the first thing I did um, when I joined NVIDIA about 18 months ago was asked, requested not to have a phone at my desk and it was exactly for that reason because the amount of voicemail messages was just, you know, it was overwhelming. So, um, but it is really hard to kind of sift through the noise but stay current and stay um, really educated about what, you know, what are the new tools that'll help us uh, effectively go to market better. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a balance. Um, you know, I think attending conferences like this and really networking and understanding understanding what, uh, what's out there, what other colleagues are using is, is really important. Um, I've made, I think I've made a real shift over the last five years into thinking about integration as a, f as a first most important uh, criteria for evaluating our, our marketing technology stack. So if I reflect back to five years ago, it was always best in breed. We wanted the best email marketing platform, the best social media listening tool, the best of you know programmatic and, D and you know DMPs. And today, integration and how the data can stitch together so that you can serve the right message message at the right time to the right person is everything. And so a lot of times we just don't have the resources to spend all of our time stitching data together. And so, um, so at NVIDIA, we've, we've kind of gone all in on the Adobe Marketing Cloud. As an example, um, you know, not every part of the Adobe Marketing Cloud is the best of breed, um, but it works because it's, it's kind of bringing things together. Uh, and then we still, you know, we still have to figure out ways to connect to Marketo, our marketing automation platform, and, and a number of other tools. But we built a data platform that sits behind, uh, behind the Adobe Marketing Cloud. We call it Voltron. I don't know if you know Voltron, so that's a Transformers reference. It's about five robots that became one giant robot. So we had this, this issue where we had islands of awesomeness around the organization. Lots of data, but it was sitting in silos with many, many different teams, and we wanted to bring all the best of that awesomeness together into one, one platform, one great data. Uh, data lake for us to um, to understand our users and really make the data clean and, and available for marketing. And so that was that was Project Voltron, how we kind of connected it to our stack. Fantastic. David, have you got 
Yeah, so you know, we're one of those companies that's probably on the higher end in terms of how many tools we have. Um, it's uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to, to rationalize and, and go through a process to really evaluate you know, how many tools we have. Um, one of the things that we got challenged with is you know, uh, there's a, a group within marketing that wants to buy a tool for one particular use case, and they're out you know, on the left side here. And there's another part of the organization buying a, a different vendor's solution, but does similar things, and they're using it for this one use case. And what I'm finding is that a lot of times, uh, our company as a whole, we're using all these different vendors, tools, and solutions, but we're only using 10%. And if we expand that 10% to 50, we'll get start seeing a lot of overlap between all these vendors. And, and that points to a lot of the data challenges we have. The more solutions we have, the more difficult it is to manage the data, and the more important the, the integration is. So, so we're along the same lines with that. Um, so you know, overall, in terms of managing and, and understanding what tools are, are out there that can help us, I depend a lot on, on the folks within the team. So you know, I, I go out to these events and try to learn as much as I can. But what I'm finding is that there's a lot of people within the organization that are very passionate about this, this space around MarTech. And they're always coming to me with, with their ideas of, of tools, Lookbook being one of them. Um, so uh, you know, a person within the organization came to me and said, hey, I use this at a different organization. It's really good. And, and that gives me ideas of, of different ways that we can use it. So that's been very, very valuable for us. So, um, and just to build on that, Nick, you know, maybe you can comment on this. You know, I was reading about um, Scott Brinker, who I think we all know as the author of Chief Martech and has now <coughs> gone to HubSpot. And he was talking about his view of the world of, uh, you know, a single database has gone away into much more of a distributed way. And he has this beautiful analogy of like little buses traveling with data between all these different endpoints. Um, and I think you're talking quite a lot about that. But it plays a little bit, I think, as well into the platform versus point solution question and, and how you make that. I mean, clearly, you have a, an awesome think point solution, you can tell me otherwise, but uh, not quite at the Adobe level yet. But, you know, how do you think about that and how do you see, you know, some of your customers and obviously yourself, you know, trying to think about those trade-offs? Yeah, <clears throat> for sure. I mean, uh, I think uh, Scott was obviously responsible for the, uh, for those, that chief MarTech magic eye graphic where I think if you stare at it long enough, there is a message in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> But there's kind of 5,000 vendors on that. And uh, really interestingly, a friend of mine who runs product at one of the leading marketing automation platform vendors, uh, he had his product team do a piece of analysis on that recently. And when you filter it for the number of companies that have increased their uh, net new ARR by a million bucks in 12 months, it falls to under 200 companies. So I'm not sure how helpful that diagram is of its own right. And from our perspective, we typically see the same 20 to 30 things in our customers' MarTech stack. Everyone's got a webinar provider. Someone's probably got something for video. Someone's got something for social. Um, there's a marketing automation platform there without a shadow of a doubt. There's CRM, et cetera. But normally, they fall into categories. The, the way that I kind of make sense of, of that diagram is to really think about the data side of it. And to, to kind of almost filter it. And I think there are four big buckets of, of data, really. If you think about um, the first wave of marketing technology from kind of 2010 onwards was marketing automation platforms, Eloqua, Marketo, et cetera. And they really dealt in binary data, visits, clicks, form fills. They either did or did not happen. Um, and they really only did it for the known database. That's great. That's my starting point. And since then, we've had some subsequent ways. We've had um, ABM. It's uh, pretty much compulsory for this many marketers to be gathered together to mention ABM. So let's do that. And AI. Well, both buzzwords killed it with one sentence. Um, <laughs> But ABM obviously then adds to that data set. It, it brings it for the anonymous visitors from key accounts and the like. So that's great. We've got binary for known. We've now got anonymous. And then obviously we've had a rise of, of kind of, what I'll loosely term, kind of predictive, uh, looking to the web to, to basically source big data, to look for intent, et cetera. So what are people doing when they're not on my properties and how do I then use that? But the fourth category I think is probably the most interesting, to my mind at least, because it's what we do. Uh, and it's 
is something which I think companies like Trust Radius are doing by extension too, which is really how are people engaging with my content? So what is the quality of that interaction? Not just did it happen, but was it successful? Because our job as marketers is actually quite simple at its core. We need to get a high volume of people to engage with a high volume of content in a meaningful way as quickly as possible. If we can do that, we're going to generate high quality marketing qualified leads with the emphasis on the queue. They will be quali qualified. That means they're educated. So to know that, we have to know that the education's happened. We have to know that they didn't spend six seconds reading my white paper, that they actually spent three minutes with it and then watch my use case video. So I think when you do that, I think you start to be able to think, the MarTech vendor that I'm looking at, how do they add to my data story? And then most personally, how are they integrated with the rest of my MarTech stack? Um, as a MarTech vendor, I'm really sorry for some of the noise, but at the same time, only 30% of our sales cycle tops is ever about us and what we do. The remaining 70% is, is how do we make this data work for you in your MarTech stack? We have to understand what it looks like. We have to talk to you about the integration with Marketo and how that data is going to flow into CRM and how a salesperson is going to make that actionable. Because if we don't, then we're in a hiding to nothing. Well, and, that, and that's, that's like the first question that, that our teams ask vendors that are coming in is, is how does that data flow? Yeah. How do we actually make sure that that's, that's going to easily connect into the system or the engine, as we call it? Um, because otherwise, if it's going to take too much time, we've already, we've already kind of lost. And have you, do, have you seen any processes? I mean, one of the things that, that I hear a lot from our customers and others is, so I come in with all this new sophisticated, and we talked a lot about data here, analytics and modeling and all this kind of stuff. And yet at the end of the day, one of the things that makes enterprise or B2B very unique is the fact that there's always people involved in that process, which is not necessarily the case in B2C. Have you seen any practices that you have or thoughts on how you help an organization take advantage of these technologies from a team perspective, either from the sales and the marketing side of the house? Yeah, I think I think um, so. I think we're getting a lot of um, a lot of interest on the enterprise side. It's a bit more complicated because there. Be, I, I think both because of um, the limited amounts of data. We you know we're a channel driven business in a lot of areas of the enterprise side. We're, we so Nvidia has both a gaming business for consumer and then and then our enterprise businesses uh, with AI and. Um, and so it gets complicated there, but it also gets complicated because, because of what B2B is like, right? The long lead cycles and, and the nurture journey. And so it's a, it's, a long, it's a long path. But I also think there's a, there is a lot of data. As we started to kind of roll up our sleeves, you know, the third party data, the ability to understand kind of which companies are visiting the site over time. Uh, when we started to kind of really get into it, there was a lot more data that we had available than we thought. Um, and now it's just we're kind of going through that exercise and making sure it's all kind of piping into one, one model. Um, but we also have done something a little bit different too, which is staffing up a data science team. So we have, uh, and they actually, they don't sit, I have marketing analytics, um, but there's a separate team now uh, that reports into the business, which is a data science team. They support my group as well as sales. And they're working on new models um, off our data platform. So they, they integrate with Voltron. Um, and they, pre they do predictive. They predict you know, um, best performing leads to score. So they're kind of partnered um, with what we do with you and, and lead space team. Uh, they, also, um, they also look at that kind of chain of content and the journey. And they're starting to work at like what's, what are those kind of key moments of truth and trigger points that we should be listening to more um, in, the, in the lead cycle. So so, um, so that's that's kind of a really cool way to kind of bring in AI, uh, but but more because we have we have the computing tools to kind of drink our own champagne, if you will. Hey, David, yeah, I'll add to that. I think uh, another part of the the talent piece that you talked about with all this influx is data. Is you know, I'm finding within the organization there's these people that are able to translate that crazy data oriented stuff into business speak. Because a lot of times the business, you know, at the highest levels of the organization, they're not familiar with how this stuff works, what the data is really telling them, and that ability to translate that complexity into a, a basically a story, tell the story behind the data, that's becoming more and more valuable for the organization as a whole. 
and uh, um, you know it, it's it's a key trait that I'm looking for when I when I build the team. So if we move a little bit beyond the data questions and the how do I integrate it questions, love to move a little bit then on to so how do you measure success and the metrics and so forth because at the end of the day um, that's core. Cool. That's why we do everything and I. My personal little bugbear is how I think marketeers have often been trained. The pendulum has swung where we used to know nothing and now every marketeer believes they have to know everything and actually that can be a, you know, the uh, analysis paralysis element of having the ability to make perfect data which is, or perfect metrics. But I'm, I'm interested in terms of thinking about you all have your own goals from a marketing program. You know, it might be how much pipeline you generated or conversion rates or brand awareness or NPS or things. Do you use those same kinds of metrics to measure the success of your technology deployments? Are you having different metrics? How do you, how do you think of if you, you know, you come here and, you know, you all believe that Lookbook is the next best thing for you. How do you then translate that into a set of metrics that you're working with overall? And um, David, maybe if you want to kick off on that. Yeah. I, so you know, based on the number of tools we have, it, it is a very different measurement for each type of tool. So something like Lookbook, where it's tangible, you could see people engaging with the with uh, your content through the solution, and it's actually trackable. And you could track that to leads coming in and, and the conversion rates or ASPs. That's definitely one area that we, we tend to always measure with, the, uh, with some of our tools where you can measure it. There are other tools that are more productivity tools. Um, you know, some of the social tools are a little bit harder to do that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but it varies. I think adoption is another one. So we have some tools that are just out there and people are not using. And, and you know, those are the ones that are on the chopping block. I would agree with the adoption uh, metric. I think largely we don't have separate marketing tech uh, benchmarks. I think largely we're, we're evaluating pipeline, we're evaluating um, kind of mid-funnel, are we driving more form completions, are we, are we getting more attendance at our conferences, webinars, et cetera, um, more business-related business, business related funnel metrics. Um, but. Uh, but I think as we look at kind of the point solutions and adding on to the platform, that's where we think, you know, what, what do we think we'll get incrementally to the business for that, that extra integration? And that's so that, but, but the kind of platform we kind of built for, you know, really delivering the right message at the right time to the right audience. Yeah, as a vendor, if we're not aligned to something that's meaningful, then that customer will churn. There's no two ways about it. Uh, it has to be conversion rates from whether or not it's inquiry to MQL or MQL to SAL, whatever it's going to be, and ultimately through to close one. Um, I had a, one of, a vendor of my own MarTech stack. We had three display providers that we were running. Um, I won't name them, but one of them we, uh, we churned recently and they were very surprised because on the face of it, their metrics looked phenomenal. They were, they were generating a ton of traffic for me, probably three times the volume of traffic that the other two uh, were generating combined. <clears throat> the problem was the traffic was meaningless. I could see that. Uh, there were people that were showing up, spending two seconds, three seconds, six seconds with my content. That doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Worse still, I've just paid for that traffic. It's, Terrifying. Um, the not being tied to something fundamental as to how that moves someone through uh, the buyer's journey led to their demise. Like their head was always on the chopping block. Um, and even worse still, I could actually see that 20% of the traffic they generated was bot traffic. So I'm not, not paying for those clicks for starters. Um, having, that, having that data meant that I was in a position to actually have a meaningful, if albeit torrid from their perspective, conversation. That's great. So, so I'm going to put you on the spot then. With all your years of expertise on these and the three of you, is there anything you would say, look, here's a really interesting lesson that others might not know in terms of thinking about measurement or metrics? Any little tips you've picked up? Uh, you know, for me, it would be probably figure out what those metrics that you want to measure up front before you even embark on something and get agreement from the company that this is, you know, all the rest of the stakeholders, that these are the metrics that we're going to use to evaluate the performance of X, Y, Z, and that's how we're going to measure it. Don't anyone ask me anything else because uh, the measurement can go 
which way you know every which way uh, when you look at these uh, uh, look at these tools and and just getting that that set at the very beginning is will save a lot of pain down the road. I think I think making sure you have really good solid clean data is is critical at this stage and we were talking about it a little bit earlier it um you know we've done a number of kind of uh, efforts campaigns and then realized that what we were looking at in the numbers wasn't really true reality uh, because we were measuring something that wasn't wasn't clean it wasn't um, it wasn't the right data and so where we had inaccuracies or gaps or errors in what we were collecting and um, and that's that's critical now because we, we're trying to be as relevant as possible to who we're talking to. And if we've missed the mark, it's just, it's an ineffective campaign and we'll see it downstream. So I think that's a, it's actually kind of reached an era. Uh, we're at a point of criticality. It just, we, we have to, we have to make sure the data is clean. We have to be responsible for it. I, I, yeah, I think uh, I would definitely echo the clean data point. That's, that's uh, phenomenally important. I think the other one is not so much a data point, but uh, is, is have a culture of it ingrained in the marketing team. We make sure that kind of half of our quarterly business review is always focused on what do the numbers say? Like, uh, and when we go into something, to have an expectation as to w what we think is going to happen doesn't always happen without shadow of a doubt. But then at that point, we can start to diagnose, well, why did it not happen? Um, but that culture has to exist. And that, I think that starts from the top and from the leadership. Um, Great. So um, thinking a little bit more, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, Serious Decisions just came out with their new framework of demand unit waterfalls, right? Which I've heard lots of interesting things, pro and negative about over the time. Uh, to use the word ABM because it is like very mainstream and I think very closely related to that. Um, and we've historically, many marketeers in the enterprise space have, have always thought of those tent poles as being CRM and marketing automation and a sort of lead centric view of the world. Do you see that changing in your organizations as you start to move into these different ways of thinking about accounts or thinking about demand units? Or is it still very early on? And is that going to affect the way that you think about your overall tech stack? And I don't know if any of you, that is a complicated question. <laughs> it's like, no, I haven't thought about that at all. Um, it's an and. I think, I think all of those things are all still really important. Um, we're very much focused on how to nurture and build communities. Of, of people who are engaged in the topics that, um, you know, that are relevant for our business. So uh, researchers who are at universities and doing amazing work on AI and, um, you know, engineering communities, uh, gamers, a huge, huge community, but not just gamers as kind of one big audience, but, you know, people who love League of Legends and people who are, you know, who are really into Overwatch, those that are competing in esports competitions. So really thinking about communities and so then the, there's a real implication to how we develop the right content and have a great content delivery system, um, how we measure what's happening in those communities because they ultimately trans translate to sales, but it's not as specific as are they in the lead pipeline right now. We might not care about whether they're in the lead pipeline right now, but we're building that engagement and we're measuring it in other ways by how they engage back with us. Uh, for CA, I think we're uh, we're a very complex organization, very sales led, and in, in, you know from a cultural perspective, and we're shifting over towards more of a marketing mindset. But the fact that we have some of these more traditional tools that we sell, i.e., mainframe, those models are not going to shift very quickly in in those for those businesses. On the other hand, you have more of a cloud, you know, SaaS related offering. That's where I think a lot of this is starting to come to life around how do we think about the funnel differently, how do we market and engage differently, and we're undergoing you know literally a transformation in our marketing team and sales team, you know tighter alignment between both so that we can uh, reorient around you know strategy and execution and measurement. Um, so so we're uh, we're kind of doing both. Is there anything specific on that sales and marketing alignment that you're doing, apart from occasionally talking? Yeah, about so we're actually 
uh, creating a concept called a demand center where we're putting literal headcount together, marketing, sales together, and that's new for CA. So um, right now the sales organization, the, the BDRs, SDRs, you know, the qualification salespeople are in the sales org. And I've, you know, a lot of other company, uh, companies have those salespeople within marketing. So this is kind of our first effort to kind of combine those into one group. And they sit, they literally sit right next to each other so they can collaborate. But yeah, that's a great idea. I love that a lot. I mean, I like the, the, the philosophy, the spirit behind the new demand unit waterfall is it's kind of spot on. It's sales and marketing alignment, consistent unit across the funnel. Implementing that, though, is a bloody nightmare. I mean, there is no demand unit in marketing automation or in CRM. So... Yeah. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> do you see anyone knowing what to do with that? Nope. Well, uh, those that do, I think, are doing it themselves. I mean, I was fascinated to hear that Alex is building kind of like a custom data layer across the MarTech stack. I think that's something that's going to happen more and more. Uh, I would say we're seeing that in probably 10 to 20% of our customer base. And I, I guess marketing, is, as Doug mentioned at the top, like marketing tech has grown up phenomenally quickly. I mean, it's a very different functional part of the business to what it was seven, ten years ago. Uh, uh, my own VP of marketing likes to say, no one said there would be maths when she got into marketing. And uh, now, it's a, now it's a big part of her daily life. And uh, one of our super smart guys, who used to be our head of engineering, now he runs our solutions team, he says that marketing is basically a programming problem now. Everything generates a piece of data. What do I do with that? That's exactly the same as programming. So. I think what the, the kind of precedent for what happens next is, is possibly ERP. Like, everything grew up really quickly across the organization. Lots of stuff was invested in. This is about as much as I know about ERP, but I'm going I'm to know a bit more. And then you had to make sense out of it all. So create a custom data layer or the like across it to make sense of it. I think that's going to be more and more important. That begs the question of, who on earth is going to do that? Do you do it in-house? Are there agencies that can do it? I don't see a lot of agencies out there that are grappling with this yet. Opportunity for companies like Leadspace, et cetera. Who knows? <laughs> Not sure we're quite there, but it's an interesting point. Actually, David, I want to bring that up with you because, yeah, you know, Nick, I love your, it's about as much as I know about ERP, which is the danger of having marketeers <laughs> drive IT strategy. <laughs> and David, for you, I, you know, you've gone from like being you know, on one side of the fence to the other side of the fence, a marketeer who now lives in the technology organization and has to deal with that. How's that going? I mean, is it like a completely different world? What are the skill gaps that we see? Yeah, uh, the number one thing that I've realized in my role is that it's a thankless job. Uh, <laughs> you know, you could spit out as many reports and it, the, people will just keep asking for more. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it's almost like... Uh, my, after the first month on my job, I went to my boss and I said, when did you ever realize that you're going to be a head of an IT department? She's like, I, I realized this like, you know, five years ago. But that's really what I am. I, I have really technical people on my team. They're developing, they're admitting the tools. Um, and, and it's a completely new world for me personally. Um, in terms of the talent, it goes back to what I said earlier. Like the, the, the people that have this ability to translate that technical knowledge into business speak for the marketers, because marketing people, as we talked about, you know, they're not good with numbers, they're not good with data, they don't know how all this stuff works. But to have someone to be able to, to translate that for them and, and really describe the value of the data or the tools or the reports in a manner that they can understand, that's like gold. Um, and, and it's something that I think more and more uh, companies are gonna rely on, on that type of skill. There you go. So we've just slagged off all of the marketeers now as being not data driven. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm one yes, of them. Although, I'm a physics I, degree. Uh, uh, although right? I'm thinking there's probably going to be an AI for that. Yeah. Very yeah. soon. Uh, okay, so That's right. Like in terms of interpreting <laughs> interpreting data and and turning that into. Yeah. So uh, so Alex, we're going to move on to AI now as the final topic. My uh, favorite really, topic. Uh, really? Yeah. I'd never have guessed actually. But um, and then. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more in the next keynote is on that, and then I'm going to open it up for questions in a minute. But but clearly the.
topic du jour, and it's very relevant as I was just downstairs with the self-driving car and we think about self-driving marketing and what does AI mean for this whole discipline and I know that there's many points of view. I'd love to just get two questions for each of you. One is, what do you think is going to be the areas where impa AI impacts your business first? Okay, where should, because like all technology, it's like where do I focus on, right? And then secondarily, is this a huge deal for you or is it just kind of something that's interesting or do you think it's all just marketing hype? Alex. Let me start, okay. Uh, so I think AI is already in a lot of what, what we do. There are a lot of tools uh, that, are, that are utilizing AI today in some form. It's going to get more and more, uh, more, and more advanced. Uh, a couple of the areas where, uh, where we partner with, with tools today that I think are really, really great are social sentiment analysis, um, ways that we can identify uh, photos and videos that people are sharing in social media and, and recognizing that that's a, you know, that's a gaming you know, that's our gaming card that's being shown in that, in that photo or image. Um, so, so we go there. We also use uh, search engine um, SEO tools that kind of predict where you would rank on, um, on Google based on what you're writing in the copy on a web page. That's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Uh, lead scoring, uh, there are a number of, of different tools that are, that are out there that are using, um, using AI that are really effective for, for marketers. Um, Having said that, so we get to, we are supposed to drink our own champagne and really figure out, I mean, it's a kind of a CEO mandate uh, at NVIDIA that every part of the organization is looking at how to make their, their area more effective through the use of AI tools. And that goes from HR to finance to IT to, to product, of course. And, um, and so we've been validating and meeting with a number of AI startups and, and there is a lot of noise at this point. There are a lot of companies that are using AI as a buzzword, as, you know, as a great way to start a conversation and cold call. And ultimately, they're not doing much that's different than, you know, than the types of analytics and tools that, you know, that we've all, all used in the past. So it is a little tricky right now. Um, but it's, you know, any place where, uh, where a tool can help use deep learning, um, neural networks to be more predictive and be able to kind of predict and enhance the accuracy of, you know, do you have the right customer? Can you predict churn? Can you predict another way that, um, that someone might be the best customer for you to follow up on? Um, those are great, you know, kind of great ways to, to use AI. I'll, I'll say for CA, we're, uh, this is a little bit dispersed in terms of how AI is being used. In marketing in particular, we're starting to use some of the, the tools out there for account propensity modeling for some of the lead, lead scoring, as you mentioned. Uh, but we also have some other groups with NCA, like in our customer team, that are, that are looking at you know, building homegrown models around predicting churn and, 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 that's, and satisfaction. So I think as the industry as a whole is kind of adopting these new tools, I think there's going to be more processes and more organizations around it too. I think right now it's still in its infancy, especially for CA and, and probably for, for many, many other companies. I think uh, AI is not an end in itself, but it is, it's, a, uh, it's remarkably powerful to solve particular business problems, some of which Alex and, and David just mentioned. The, the one which, we're, which I'm personally most interested in is, is kind of personalization at scale. And personalization means more than, dear Nick, in an email, uh, or they're from Canada, show them something about can spam on the front of the website, which I still get an awful lot. Um, it needs to be more how do I actually personalize the buyer's journey. And that can't be done manually. That's, that's, there's an infinite number of potential customer journeys for you. It can't happen manually, so it has to, has to, uh, has to be driven by machine learning and AI. So that's something which we're grappling with, kind of right content to the right person at the right time. The problem becomes is where's the data set to power that? And we've had uh, machine learning in our, in our 
particular our, our own solution for over 12 months now. And uh, it's good. It's as good as we can make it in the absence of a better data set. So uh, what we're doing with the vast majority of our customers is building that data set in the first place. H&R Block is able to use Watson because IBM trained Watson on the US tax code, which might be a buggers model, as we would say in the UK, it's stupidly complicated, but it is a known data set, it's fixed. So where is B2B marketing's kind of equivalent data set? It can't just be on intent, we've been playing around with intent for a long time now, and there are certain third party providers that will tell me when someone shows up on my website that Bob is interested in finance. It's not really very helpful if I sell financial reporting software, right? The taxonomy for an awful lot of intent companies is kind of 2,400 things across all of B2B. So getting more granular with that so that I can actually then start to map it against the content taxonomy, which is far richer, that's when stuff will start to really sing. And that's, that's something which my product team is heads down on. They better be anyway. I'm not there, obviously, but I think they are today. So it all goes really round back to the start of where we started, right? Which is the intelligence you can build on top of stuff is based really around some of the data sets that you can bring to bear, whether they're internal data sets, external data sets, how do you drive the data management to be able to solve that problem? The small data elements that you have in B2B to hopefully shape the way that marketeers go. Um, and one of the things I like to say, and you know, we, we actually ran a study showing that the number one most disliked thing of marketeers is to manage data. 89% of people put that as the top hate. Obviously, the top fun is to run campaigns. So, you know, my hope is that we can actually use this process to actually help allow marketeers, some of whom are technical, some of whom aren't, to get back to the process of building great campaigns, which I think is still the creative spark of why many of us joined us. So, uh, with that, I, do I have any questions in the room for the the panel and the audience, I could ask questions forever. It's a very rich topic. Any hands? Yeah. Or you can just shout it out and I'll repeat it. I'd just like, like to know, what are some of the popular marketing technologies that you guys are using with companies? A whole bunch of marketing companies, new and old, have sprung up. So what is the typical marketing over here? So there you go. It's the, so how about this? So everyone got the question. The question is, what would be some technologies that you guys use, I assume, that have impact or something, right? Um, maybe one that's an established one and then maybe one that's an emerging one for each of you guys. And you, Nick, you're not allowed to say your own company. No. I'll say your company. Okay. Uh, we do eat our own dog food, which is not as nice as drinking our own champagne. I, um, I wondered where that came from. Yeah, you know. that, where did that, that get that changed? Um, Only in America, right? We're going to start to adopt that. Uh, I guess, I mean, we, we have a, a quite a big MarTech stack for a company our size because we try to replicate what our significantly larger customers do. So we have to do things like run Eloqua, Marketo, and Pardot, which is, which is interesting. Um, I guess from, from an infrastructure side of things, we have majored on, on uh, Marketo and Salesforce as, as the backbone of our MarTech stack, or the plumbing, if you like. Now, plumbing's hard to get value out of until you need to have a shower or go to the loo or do any of those things that require plumbing. So then I think about everything else that we built on top of it as the shower or the jacuzzi, etc. cetera. Um, one of my, uh, in addition to myself, one of my, one of my f favorite things that I guess- you want. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, I, was, so the most important thing I think is, is, is going forward is, is might be some of the IP to account matching stuff that kind of demand base and kick fire and stuff do because uh, Apple's changes to Safari's treatment of first party cookies is something which we as an industry will Boy. start to unravel. So other ways of identification of visitors is gonna become critical. So lead to account matching and anonymous to known yeah. conversion. Oh yeah, engage you. Yes, engage you. Okay. Well, there's many I think I already said the Adobe Marketing Cloud. Um, we're, we're kind of all in on the Experience Cloud suite um, there. And Marketo is our marketing automation platform. And then we connect the data back um, on our data platform to make sure that those, those two are connected. Um, an emerging one is the social sentiment tool I talked about. We use Signal Labs. Uh, they powered the RNC and DNC during the election process. And they work with a number of other 
uh, a number of other companies, and then we train the, the sentiment model. So we have a social analyst who is kind of going back in and and making that um, that sentiment score um, more more accurate over time. So we have Marketo as well. So Marketo, Salesforce. We also have Adobe for our web properties. Um, you know, some of the newer tools we've been using: Demand Base, uh, Mintigo for the predictive. Um, and then we have a lot of other, you know, a ton of other smaller ones, but those are the ones top of mind. And I'll just add one other, um, obviously not allowed to plug ourselves for the same reason, but um, even though we do a lot of that stuff. Um, so we've been using PFL, I don't know if you know PFL, right, which I think is also part of a bigger trend, um, which is back to direct mail, right? Um, because as AI comes and we get more and more technologies deployed, it actually, increases the premium of the value it takes to actually engage. And so we ourselves have seen huge success by actually, on a highly targeted basis, sending high value items to people because it breaks through the noise and the clutter. And I think it's, as we see content marketing decline in effectiveness, because like everyone produces way too much content now, mm -hmm. the ability to ch flip the funnel on its head and target very specific people with high value content, which shows that you care, I think, we are seeing, and we work with customers like Salesforce and others, on that highly targeted, relevant engagement with people that breaks through the noise, which allows you to have a conversation and obviously put a sell. Um, I think we're out of, do we have any more time? Are we out of time? Who is our person? I think we are out of time. Okay. Well, thank you very much to a great panel. Um, and your thank insights you. in this.